Hello, and welcome to Be Still and Know. Today's video is going to be a continuation of the Ancient Astronaut Theory video series that I've been doing, and that is going to be on features of ancient astronaut theory, mysterious ancient structures built using advanced mathematics methods and tools, and this one is on Asia. So let's quickly go over our ancient astronaut theory definition one more time. Ancient astronaut theory, sometimes referred to as ancient alien theory, is the idea that intelligent, self-aware, extraterrestrial, interdimensional, inner earth dwelling, or even time traveling beings visited earth and made contact with humans in antiquity and prehistoric times. Proponents suggest that this contact influenced the development of modern cultures, technologies, architecture, religions, and even human biology. A common position is that deities from most, if not all, religions religions are extraterrestrial in origin, and that advanced technologies brought to Earth by ancient astronauts were interpreted as evidence of divine status by early beings. All right, and we're going to go into today, starting with Angkor Wat. Okay, so here is the first site that we're going to go over today, and that is Angkor Wat, Bang Mayalea, Taprom Temple, and Bayon Temple. And these are actually four different sites, but we're just going to group them into one because they're all around the same area of Asia. And they are in mainland Southeast Asia, which is modern-day Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, and West Malaysia. Angkor Wat is a Hindu temple complex in Cambodia and is the largest religious monument in the world on a site measuring 402 acres. Originally constructed as a Hindu temple dedicated to the god Vishnu during the Khmer Empire, it was gradually transformed into a Buddhist temple toward the end of the 12th century. It was built by the Khmer king Surivarman II in the early 12th century in Yasodharapura, present-day Angkor, the capital of the Khmer Empire, as his state temple and eventual mausoleum. Breaking from the Shaiva tradition of previous kings, Angkor Wat was instead dedicated to Vishnu. Surivarman II was unusual among Khmer kings in making Vishnu the preserver god rather than and Shiva, the destroyer god, the focus of court religious life. The reasons for this decision are not known. Scholars have long debated whether this association with Vishnu helps explain why Angkor Wat faces west, the cardinal direction with which Vishnu is associated, rather than the common orientation for Khmer temples of east. The temple complex gazes upon the West, which has created divided opinions among scholars concerning its symbolism. In Hindu, the West designates the direction of death, which has led some to consider the temple's first purpose as a tomb. Allegedly, Angkor Wat is the architectural manifestation of the sacred mountain Maru, the legendary home of the divas in Hindu mythology, or what would be the equivalent to Mount Olympus in Greek mythology. Archaeologists have discovered that the stone used to build the temple comes from mines located at the base of the mountain that is adjacent to the site. However, they are still wondering how the rock was transported through the thick jungles to the site location, leaving some to speculate the use of sound, frequency, or anti-gravity levitation. And here is an image. On the sides we have Mount Maru, and on the other side we have Mount Olympus. And this is supposed to be like a representation of the home of the gods. For centuries, travelers and explorers were captivated by the beauty of Angkor Wat. One of the most interesting accounts comes from the Chinese traveler Zhou Daguan, who was sent as a diplomat under the Emperor Cheng Zhong of Yuan of China. Zhou had arrived at the temple complex in August 1296 and remained at the court of King Indravarman III until July 1297. Zhou's insights on the life and times of the early Angkor Wat are noted in The Customs of Cambodia, a book written during his diplomatic visit. He writes about the fascinating customs, religious practices, and the role of women and slaves in this society. According to some of the unusual tales, it is believed that the temple was constructed in a single night by divine mystical architects. According to legend, the construction of Angkor Wat was ordered by Indra to serve as a palace for his son Prechaket Mealea. Upon investigation, I did not find the deity Indra to have a son named Prechaket Mealea, but there is another temple site a couple of meters away called Bang Mealea, which is very similar in design to Angkor Wat and is believed to have been built around the same time. So here are on the left, temple at Bang Mayalea images, and then we have on the right the temple at Taprom, and then in the middle we have the Naga, which are multi-headed serpent deities that are half human and half cobra, and these statues are found at multiple Khmer sites. So this was a beautiful culture, and just amazing how the jungle has taken over the old temples that they had there. So it's just amazing. 
Building at Anchor Watt was stopped and continued during various power shifts over several decades, and it is thought that the original architects might have had different purposes for the site. The later Buddhist architectural influences are evidence of this. Eventually, building at the site stopped, and it was largely forgotten. Although neglected and nearly abandoned in the 16th century because of the lakes surrounding the site, the main temple remained largely protected from damage caused by trees and jungle growth. The same cannot be said for Bang Mayalea, which has severe dilapidation and damage from forest growth despite it originally having a moat around it. Later Khmer sites like the Bayon Temple at Angkor Thom and Top Trom Temple have also been severely damaged by jungle growth. Built in the late 12th or early 13th century as the state temple of the Mahayana Buddhist King Jayavarman VII, the Bayon Temple stands at the center of Jayavarman's capital, Angkor Thom. Its most famous features are the towers with 216 serene and smiling faces thought to belong to the Bodhisattva of Compassion, Avalokitesvara, or even modeled after Jayavarman VII himself. All right, so we're going to move on from mainland Southeast Asia to the Kailasa Temple in the Ellora Caves in Maharashtra, India. The Kailasa Temple is the largest of the rock-cut Hindu temples at the Ellora Caves in Maharashtra, India. A megalith carved from a rock cliff face, it is considered one of the most remarkable cave temples in the world because of its size, architecture, and sculptural treatment. It is considered the climax of the rock-cut phase of Indian architecture. The top of the superstructure over the sanctuary is 107 feet above the level of the court below, although the rock face slopes downwards from the rear of the temple to the front. The Kailasa Temple, Cave 16, is the largest of the 34 Buddhist, Jain, and Hindu cave temples and monasteries known collectively as the Ellora Caves, ranging for over 1.5 miles along the sloping basalt cliff at the site. Most of the excavation of the rock cliff and major parts of the structure are generally attributed to the 8th century Rashtrakuta king Krishna I, with some of the sculptures completed later. The temple contains a number of relief and freestanding sculptures on a grand scale equal to the architecture, although only traces remain of the paintings which originally decorated it. Its construction is generally attributed to the Rashtrakuta king Krishna I, based on two epigraphs that link the temple to Krishna Raja. However, the attribution of the temple to Krishna I is not completely certain because these epigraphs are not physically connected to the caves and do not date to Krishna Raja's reign. Moreover, the land grants issued by Krishna's successors do not contain any references to the Kailasa temple. The Kailasa temple features the use of multiple distinct architectural and sculptural styles. This, combined with its relatively large size has led some scholars to believe that its construction spanned the reigns of multiple kings. M. K. Devalikar, in 1982, analyzed the architecture of the temple and concluded that the major part of the temple was completed during the reign of Krishna I, although he agreed that some other parts of the temple complex can be dated to the later rulers. According to Devalikar, the following components were the oldest part of the original temple. The main shrine, its gateway, the Nandi Mandapa, the lower story, the elephant lion frieze, the court elephants, and the victory pillars. Valikar admits that the most important sculpture of the temple, which depicts Ravana shaking the Kailasa mountain, appears to have been built after the main edifice. This sculpture is considered as one of the finest pieces of Indian art, and it's possible that the temple came to be known as Kailasa after it was sculpted. So here are some images of the lions and the elephants. The Kailasa temple is notable for its vertical excavation. Carvers started at the top of the original rock and excavated downward. The traditional methods were rigidly followed by the master architect, which could not have been achieved by excavating from the front. A medieval Marathi legend appears to refer to the construction of the Kailasa temple. The earliest extant text to mention this legend is Katha Kalapataru by Krishna Yash Navalki. According to this legend, the local king suffered from a severe disease. His queen prayed to the god Grishneshwar, also known as Shiva, at Elapura to cure her husband. She vowed to construct a temple if her wish was granted and promised to observe a fast until she could see the shikara or the top of this temple. After the king was cured, she requested him to build a temple immediately, but multiple architects declared that it would take months to build a temple complete with a shikara. One architect named Kokasa assured the king that the queen would be able to see the shikara of a temple within a week's time. He started building the temple from the top by carving a rock. He was able to finish the shikara within a week's time, enabling the queen to give up her fast. The temple was named Manikeshwar after the queen. M. K. Devalikar theorizes that Kokasa was indeed the chief architect of Kailasa Temple, which may have been originally known as Manikeshwar. Multiple 11th to 13th century inscriptions from central India mention architects born in the illustrious family of Kokasa. Okay, in this image we see Shiva and Parvati sitting on Mount Kailash as Ravana tries to lift it. On the left, Ravana was a huge devotee of Shiva. Ganesha, the elephant-headed son of Parvati and Shiva, on the right, is also included in some of the iconic sculptures.
In addition to the numerous Hindu sculptures, there are many Buddhist sculptures present at the temple as well. A total of 200,000, other estimations range from 150,000 to 400,000, tons of rock were excavated out of a vertical basalt cliff in the Sharanandri Hills to form the magnificent Kailasa Temple. It may be added that the temple was supposedly carved from top to bottom with only simple hammers and chisels. In modern terms, it would take around 200 days, working at 24 hours per day, to excavate the entire site using contemporary technology. That doesn't take into account the elaborate carvings all over the monolithic structure. There are also holes dug that are impossible for a human to reach and access. Even a person as short as three feet would not have been able to dig or carve these holes that are perfectly cylindrical. Some speculate a computer-controlled drill or power tool was used, which is not possible according to historians who claim the sculptors only had primitive hand-carving tools. There is a legend that Kailaza Temple may have been built much quicker than is believed by mainstream historians in only a few days, and was done using some sort of laser printing or cutting technology, possibly with pre-programmed architectural designs Instead of a modern 3D printer, which uses additive architecture to build up a design layer by layer, this machine must have utilized some sort of subtractive architecture technology that could have cut the design and either destroyed or vaporized the rock, or workers could have removed the leftover rubble after the machine was done. Tunnels beneath the temple are said to house and protect this technology for use in the future. In any case, the resulting Kailasa temple is a masterpiece worthy as a tribute to the gods. Apart from the ingenuity needed to accomplish this feat, the Kailasa temple is also noteworthy for its numerous sculptures. In the main courtyard, for example, there is an image of Nandi, the sacred cow of Shiva, who is facing the Shiva Linga. These traditional features can be found in all temples dedicated to Shiva. At the base of the temple, elephant sculptures may be seen, which gives the viewer an impression that the whole structure is being supported on the backs of these beasts. Furthermore, various intricately carved panels may be found in the Kailasa temple. Some of these, for example, depict scenes from the two major Hindu epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Additionally, in the southeastern gallery of the temple, there are ten panels depicting the different avatars of the Hindu god Vishnu. There is an interesting tale about the Kailasa temple that dates to the Mughal period. During the reign of the emperor Aurangzeb, an attempt was made by the Mughals to destroy the temple. Aurangzeb had already destroyed countless Hindu temples and had intended to add Kailasa temple to this list. It is said that a thousand workers were sent to dismantle the temple. Three years passed and the temple only suffered minimal damage, i.e. several disfigured or broken statues. Realizing that it was impossible to completely destroy the temple, Aurangzeb finally gave up. And here is an honorable mention site. I didn't include a full description of it, but it is Vetuvan Coil Temple. And this is in Kalugamalai, Tutkuri District, state of Tamil Nadu, India. Vetuvan Coil Temple is thought to have been started shortly after Kailasa Temple but was never completed. It is thought to be a copy or miniature version of the temple, though the architectural style does seem to be different. As per local legend, there was a rivalry between a father and son sculptors on who would attain the best specimen. The son started to work on the lower rock for the Murugan Shrine while the father started working uphill. The son claimed that the father would never finish the shrine, which infuriated the father to kill the son. It is believed that the son was able to finish the Murugan Temple at the foothills, but the father's work on this temple was incomplete. Another variant of the legend states that the father wanted his son to take time to learn the tricks to start his work. Forgoing the orders of the father, the son started chiseling in the inner chamber. Hearing the sound enraged by the disobedience, the father killed the son. There are two literal Tamil meanings for Vetuvan Koil, one of which means heaven of sculptors, while the other means the temple of slayer. Okay, and here is another honorable mention site that I'm not going to completely give the description for, and that was just because when I was researching Kailasa Temple, I kept coming across all these images from the Kajurahu Sex Temple, and that is in Shatarpur District, Madhya Pradesh, India. And this temple is dedicated to fertility and sex, and it was just so strange that I kept seeing all these images that I decided to put together a couple slides of images for it. And these aren't even the most graphic of the sex images. So here are some, and and here are some more. <laughs> it's amazing that these finely detailed and sculpted temples are still standing today hundreds of years, thousands of years later. Just amazing to me. 
Okay, we're going to move on to another site that's also in India, and that is the Unakoti Sculptures in Tripura, India. Located in the Raghunandan Hills of the northeastern Indian state of Tripura, Unakoti has been a Hindu pilgrimage site since at least the 7th century. Unlike most Hindu sacred sites with temple constructions, Unakoti is famous for its collection of enormous bas-relief carvings on the side of a rocky hill. Archaeologically, little is known about Unakoti, including who created the megalithic carvings. Nor do the site's myths, though fascinating, reveal any more detail. The bas-relief sculptures of Unakoti are the largest size found in India, and their styles of carving, classical and tribal, indicate that they were made during very different, possibly far older, historical periods. The primary deities depicted at Unakoti are Shiva, Durga, and Ganesha, based on similarities between some of the features and later iterations of these deities. It is possible these could have been representing the earliest versions of these figures that would later form the Hindu pantheon. On the top of the hill above Unakoti may also be found images of Vishnu, Hanuman, and Ravana, as well as remains of a temple that may have existed before the sculptures were made. The statues of Shiva at Unakoti are 30 feet tall. The images found at Unakoti are of two types, namely rock carved figures and stone images. Among the rock cut carvings, the central Shiva head and gigantic Ganesha figures deserve special mention. The central Shiva head, known as Unakoti Swara, called by Rava, is about 30 feet high, including an embroidered headdress, which itself is 10 feet high. On each side of the headdress of the central Shiva, there are two full size female figures one of Durga standing on a lion head, and another female figure on the other side. In addition, three enormous images of Nandi bull are found half buried in the ground. There are various other stone as well as rock cut images at Unakoti. According to one myth, Unakoti, which literally means one less a Koti in the Bengali language, traces its origins to a short visit by the god Shiva. On his way to Mount Kailash, some sources say to the sacred city of Banaras, Shiva had encamped for a night at the rocky Ragunandan hill along with a Koti of other deities. A Koti equals 10 million in the Indian number system. Before commencing a night of revelry with the deities, Shiva told them to wake before dawn so they could continue their long journey. Upon waking, he found them still asleep, however. Dismayed, he left alone, while the other gods and goddesses turned into stone images. Since then, there have been a Koti minus one, minus Shiva, deities at the site. Another myth, popular with the regional people, tells of a sculptor named Kalu Kumar, who fashioned the stone carvings of the deities. A devotee of Parvati, the wife of Shiva, Kalu Kumar wished to accompany Shiva and Parvati to their abode on Mount Kailash. Shiva was wary of this matter, and so Parvati came up with a solution. She suggested that if the sculptor made 10 million images of Shiva and the deities before dawn the following day, he could accompany them to Kailash. As the sun rose the next day, however, Kalu Kumar was one short of a koti, which gave Shiva the excuse to leave him behind. A variation of this story is that in a dream, Kalu Kumar was given the task of carving the 10 million deities. He did so, yet swayed by his pride and perhaps hopeful of being considered divine himself, he made the last carving in an image of himself, making the number one less a koti of deities. Okay, so my take on the Unakoti sculptures is that this was carved in very, very deep antiquity by some of the earlier peoples from the area that colonized this area. And I believe that this civilization's sculptures ended up becoming part of the later Hindu pantheon. So I think that these are kind of like the original forms of these deities before they were more refined over time. That's what I think anyway. There's really no way to know, but just seeing how old they are and how nobody really knows where they came from and how some of their deities are similar, but not really all the way the same as the modern depictions of some of the Hindu deities, I think this might be one of the precursors to the Hindu pantheon. Okay, here are the Longyu Caves, and we're going to go all the way to China. This is in Fenghuang Hill, Xi'an Beikun Village, Longyu County, Kuzhou Prefecture, Zhejiang Province, China. The Longyu Caves, also called the Shaonan High Stone Chambers, are a group of 24 artificial sandstone caverns located at Fenghuang Hill near the village of Xi'an Beikun on the Ku River in Longyu County, Kuzhou Prefecture, Zhejiang Province, China. 
Created more than 2,000 years ago, they were not recorded in any historical documents and were rediscovered by farmers in 1992. In June 1992, four farmers in Longyu discovered the caves by accident when they drained the water of five small ponds in their village. The ponds turned out to be five large man-made caverns. Further investigation revealed 19 more caverns nearby. They have been determined to be more than 2,000 years old, and their construction is not recorded in any historical documents. The caves are very large considering their man-made origin. The average floor area of each cave is over 1,000 square meters, or 11,000 square feet, with heights of up to 30 meters, 98 feet, and the total area covered is in excess of 30,000 square meters, or 320,000 square feet. The ceiling, wall, and pillar surfaces are all finished in the same manner, as a series of parallel bands or courses about 60 centimeters wide, containing parallel chiseling marks set at an angle of about 60 degrees to the axis of the course. They have maintained their structural integrity and appear not to interconnect with each other. They represent one of the largest underground excavations of ancient times and are an enduring mystery that have perplexed experts from every discipline that has examined them. Scientists from around the world in the fields of archaeology, architecture, engineering, and geology have absolutely no idea how they were built, by whom, and why. Carved into solid silt stone, each grotto descends around 30 meters underground and contains stone rooms, bridges, gutters, and pools. There are pillars even evenly distributed throughout the caves, which are supporting the ceiling and walls. The ceiling and stone columns are uniformly decorated with chisel marks in a series of parallel lines. Only one of the caves has been opened for tourism, chosen because of the stone carvings found inside which depict a horse, fish, and bird. These were probably done during more recent eras and are most likely not part of the original cave construction. A rough estimation of the workload involved in building these five caves is awe-inspiring. The quantity of rock that would have been removed in the overall excavation of the grottos is estimated to be nearly a million cubic meters. Taking into account the average digging rate per day per person, scientists have calculated that it could have taken a thousand people working day and night for six years to complete. These calculations are based purely on hard labor, but what they haven't taken into account is the incredible care and precision of the sculptors, meaning that the actual workload would have far surpassed the theoretical estimation. As for how they were constructed and what tools were used is still unknown. No tools have been found in the area and scientists still don't know how they achieve such symmetry, precision and similarity between the different caves. Despite their size and the effort involved in creating them, so far no trace of their construction or even their existence has been located in the historic record. Although the overall excavation involved almost a million cubic meters of stone, there is no archaeological evidence revealing where that quantity of stone went, and no evidence of the work. Moreover, there is not a single historic document that refers to them, which is highly unusual considering the sheer scale of the project. Their origin is a complete and utter mystery. Every single one of the caves is covered from floor to ceiling in parallel lines that have been chiseled into virtually every surface. The effect is a uniform pattern throughout the caves, which would have required immense manpower and endless hours to create. The question is why? Was such labor-intensive work purely for decoration? Are the lines or patterns symbolic in some way? Some speculate that they could be tool marks for a large machine that sculpted and drilled into the rock to create the caves. All that is currently known is that the markings are similar to those found on pottery housed in a nearby museum, which is dated between 500 and 800 BC. When the caves were first discovered, they were filled with water, which presumably had been there for a long period of time. They had to be pumped out in order to realize that these were not just like the other bottomless ponds found within the area, but man-made structures. Most villages in southern China contain very deep ponds, which have been called bottomless ponds by generations of villagers. These ponds teem with fish, which are easily caught. However, after the first cave was pumped dry, not a single fish was to be seen or any other sign of life. One of the most interesting and challenging questions is how the caves have been able to keep their structural integrity for more than 2,000 years. There are no signs of collapse, no piles of rubble, and no damage despite the fact that in some areas the walls are only 50 centimeters thick. Over the centuries, the area has gone through numerous floods, calamities, and wars. The mountains have changed their appearance and exposed stones have been weathered, but the inside of the caves, the form, patterns, and markings are still clear and precise. It is as though they were built yesterday.
Due to the great depth of the caves, some areas at the bottom which are not exposed to the opening above are pitch black. Yet even those dark areas are decorated with thousands of parallel lines on the walls, columns, and ceiling. So how did the ancient people work in the dark? According to Jia Gong, a Tongji University professor specializing in civil engineering, there should be lamps because the cave's mouth is very small, and the sunbeam could only shine in the cave at a certain angle during a certain period of time. As one goes deeper into the cave, the light becomes dimmer. At the cave's bottom, which is usually dark, dozens of meters from the mouth, one could hardly see anything. However, this was at least two millennia ago and nothing that could have been used for lighting has ever been found. All of the 36 grottos are distributed across an area of only one square kilometer. Considering such a high density, one cannot help asking whether some grottos were meant to be connected. What would be the purpose of making so many separate caves in such a tight area without connecting them? In many areas, the walls between the caves are very thin, only 50 centimeters, but they were never linked so it appears that they were intentionally kept apart. What's more, many of the caves are almost identical to each other. Nobody has any idea who built the caves. Some scientists have claimed that it was not possible or logical for such a mammoth job to have been undertaken by regular village people. Only the emperor and the leaders could have organized such a huge project, like the construction of the Great Wall, which was built to defend against invasion from the outside. But if it was commissioned by an emperor, there are no historical records of its construction. According to Yang Hongchun, an expert at the Archaeological Institute of Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, at the bottom of each cave, the ancient builders wouldn't be able to see what the others were doing in the next grotto, but the inside of each cave had to be parallel with that of the other, or else the wall would be holed through. Thus, the measure of apparatus should have been very advanced. There must have been some layout about the sizes, locations, and the distances between the caves beforehand. With the help of modern equipment and methods, the investigators measured the sizes of the walls and surprisingly found that the overall construction is extremely accurate. The walls between the caves are of the same thickness in different sections. So how did they achieve this precision? What were their methods? Some archaeologists have suggested that the grottos were the tombs of old emperors, emperor halls, or places for storage, but this interpretation is far-fetched. No funeral object or tombs has been found and no artifacts left behind. If it were used like an emperor's palace, the grottos would have been designed differently with separate rooms for different purposes, like entertaining, meeting, and sleeping. But no evidence can be found of this, and no traces of habitation have been found. Another hypothesis is that it was used for mining and extracting some type of mineral resource. However, mining operations would have required equipment and apparatus to extract the rocks and transport them. Again, no traces of this have been found, nor any evidence of where the rocks were taken. And of course, if the caves were just for mining, why create such intricate decorations on the walls, columns, and ceilings? Finally, some have suggested that the grottos were the places for troops to be stationed and that an emperor of the past wanted to keep his soldiers out of view in order to keep his war preparations secret. However, these caves could not have been built in a short period of time. They would have taken many, many years to build, so it is unlikely to have been done in preparation for war, which tends to come about much more quickly. Furthermore, there are no signs of people having stayed in the caves. All right, so that is the Longview Caves, and my interpretation of that is that a giant machine from the past carved these caves. And they probably did it quickly, they probably didn't take very long, it might have been similar to the way that the Kailasa Temple was carved with a pre-cut design or pre-programmed design into the subtractive architecture where they just have to remove the rubble or vaporize the rubble. And so that could have been a way that they'd constructed this. I believe that the power tools existed in the past because obviously look at these designs. It is clearly evidence of some kind of drilling tool. Okay, so that is the end of our Features of Ancient Astronaut Theory, Mysterious Ancient Structures Built with Advanced Mathematics Methods and Tools Asia video. So thank you again for joining me at Be Still and Know with Adam. Remember that if you like this video and you like this new series, please like and subscribe to my channel. Please feel free to support me so that I can continue to get better at editing and get better equipment. And remember, that no matter what comes your way, it's going to be a great day. Thanks again for joining me, and I'll see you later.